Good morning, everyone. And Lee, thanks for having me, and it's a thrill to be here. So uh, I think we have a presentation set up. I'm going to see how uh, we can uh, load that up. Um, and then I'll be clicking through it uh, from here. We'll see how this goes. We have a saying at uh, Singularity that artificial intelligence or AI is really easy, but AV is really hard. <laughs> trying to do that from, uh, around the world is a whole other uh, thing. So um, I'm, uh, let me know when my slides are up, uh, and then I'll be able to uh, click through them. Excellent. All right. So um, I'm going to uh, flip through these fairly quickly. You know, uh, if you we're turning the world into information, and you could argue that we're digitizing the world fairly quickly uh, using tech, using all of the disposal and devices that we have in our hand. And these new information layers are now uh, creating very dramatic new breakthroughs across all of these very fast-moving technologies that you see on the screen. Um, I've been building out this organization for about uh, four years. And we're literally those four Ds that I've made, listed there, demonetization, democratization, et cetera. That's what we're doing to the world. And it's happening very, very quickly, much faster than we could imagine. Um, the last few years, I've been building out this organization. I'm the, uh, I was the head of innovation at Yahoo before this. That's my uh, White House uniform. This is a little bit more my Silicon Valley outfit here. Um, and we're, we're seeing very dramatic change in the pace of, uh, of information flow. And I'm going to talk you through what the implications of are. We're arguably in the middle of a very technological change, right? We're driving the world forward with technology. If you look back um, a thousand years, uh, uh, look for our progress in local. We, uh, anything important that happened happened within a day's walk of us. Today, something that happens around the world happens in minutes. And at the pace of change and the speed with which we're moving the world forward, we're driving the world forward today with computing. Uh, the, Ten years ago, my laptop had the equivalent computing power of the brain of an insect. That's how much raw computing power it had in it. Today, my $1,000 laptop is the equivalent of computing power of the brain of a mouse. Uh, in 10 years, it'll be the equivalent of a human brain. And in 20 years after that, we'll have the equivalent computing power of my $1,000 laptop of all 7 billion human brains on the planet. And the question is, what would we do with it? Um, I don't know if you folks can see, but I can't see which screen I'm on. Uh, back to the AV folks. Maybe you folks who just yell out what you're seeing on the screen will navigate that way. Anybody? Yeah. Graph slide. OK, great. If we go to the next slide. Um, so today, uh, this is the original microprocessor. Um, which uh, had 200 chips on it, you know, all moving at a very slow pace. And now we have teraflops of computing on that same uh, uh, space. Um, and we've seen, if you, we did a calculation, if you had seen the same progress, uh, we've seen 40% a year uh, increase in desktop computing speeds over the last 30, 40 years. We calculated that if the top speed of a car had gone up in the same 40% rate, uh, per year, we would today have a car that went faster than the speed of light. And that gives you some sense of how dramatically computing has changed over the last 30, 40 years. Um, the world's fastest supercomputer from four years ago is now being dismantled because it's out of date. Right? And now that computing is embedded in all of our devices, uh, we're essentially exploding that across the world, and we now have a huge amount of information. The, the, all of the computing and all of our mobile devices is now turned the world system. Uh, our mobile phones is across that, across all of those uh, devices. We're, we're soon seeing today about a billion odd people online. We'll see in the next few years uh, five billion people uh, come online, uh, and so literally from one billion today to five billion people being online by the end of the decade. Right, so very dramatic uh, pace of change uh, in in this realm. Um, I'm going to look at one of these technologies to kick off with. So there's the graph of uh, 5 billion people coming online. And just imagine what those uh, 3 billion people will do. It'll add trillions of dollars to the global economy uh, in, in, uh, in very short order. Um, if you look at one of these technologies moving very quickly is 3D printing. And many of you are probably familiar with 3D printing. Uh, we can now do this uh, also called additive manufacturing. We can now do this across 70 or so different materials. Um, the, uh, the shape in the bottom there, the, the Mobius strip looking thing, is actually titanium. 
Um, and one of the inflection points, when we study accelerating technologies, we're always looking at what are the inflection points in a particular technology that have it accelerate. And in 3D printing, there are two of them. Uh, the first one is in the, uh, that you can make shapes for the first time that you couldn't mold. That shape at the bottom and the middle, you couldn't mold that. You essentially have to assemble it. But a 3D printer could just spit it out. On the right, that's actually a bicycle. You can see that video on YouTube. They've 3D printed a bicycle one hundredth of an inch, a layer at a time. They take it out of the printer, get on the bike, and ride away. Right? Uh, on the bottom left, that's actually food. Um, we now have 3D printers that can spray chocolate into place and so on. And I'll predict here that the within five or six years, the pastry chef industry will slowly disappear because we'll be able to have printers to do that. Um, and at the top left, we're actually looking at blue 3D printers, about a $2,000 intermediate level printer. It will fabricate 70% of the parts to make the next printer. Right? Um, and so we're entering a very funky new world. In fact, when you get that printer, the first thing you do when you get it home is you print out the last few parts uh, of itself. Right? So rather surreal where we're going uh, with all of that. We're making all sorts of fascinating new materials. Um, this is a chainmail type substance with a flexible chain. And here's a, a photograph of some of the things that we've been producing in labs. Um, uh, all sorts of interesting complex objects. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. I'll just wait for the, the real. And the second inflection point, the, the first inflection point was that you can make things you couldn't mold. The second inflection point in 3D printing is that uh, it's always been true in manufacturing that a more complex object costs more, right? The materials, the fabrication techniques, the assembly of it, and so on. Um, 3D printing is interesting in that complexity is free. Uh, if you look at the yellow shape in the middle, which is fairly simple, the printer does not care if you're printing that shape or one of the more complex shapes around it. It's essentially the analogy would be, if I have an inkjet printer, it doesn't pr care if I'm printing a photograph, which is very complex, or just a straight black line. It just throws ink out onto the page. And so the 3D printer doesn't care, and it allows us this liberation of essentially complexity being free. If we go to the next slide, you'll see this guitar. Uh, every piece of that guitar, except for the strings, has been 3D printed, every single piece of it. Right? Uh, and so very dramatic new things. There's a huge furor in the US right now because somebody's 3D printed a gun, um, and uh, which is pretty interesting for most parts of the world. For the US, it's so easy to get a gun anyway. I don't see why they need to 3D print one. Uh, I'm actually Canadian, so I have a different perspective on the, the politics here than most people here do. Um, but dramatically changing the face of the nature. And 3D printing is one of those technologies. It will not replace traditional manufacturing completely as we know it, but it adds a whole new capability that we never saw before. And this is where this is uh, going to explode. Um, uh, as Emily mentioned, we're based at NASA Ames and Singularity in, in Silicon Valley. There are 10 NASA centers around the country and we're, we're based at the center where they do all of the R&D and supercomputing for all of NASA. Uh, and this graph on this next slide is the one thing I'd like you not to forget. Uh, our two co-founders are Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis. Uh, Peter wrote a book called Abundance, showing that all of these technologies extrapolated out and properly implemented would deliver us abundance within a decade in clean water, health care, education, and so on. So we're very optimistic of the world. And we first put this graph together. And this is one thing that if you can remember for the rest of the time, uh, this will be one thing. Ray started graphing the price performance of computing. Um, and in fact, we'll pass more all the way back to 1900. And in fact, we had a very steady flowing pattern in uh, imputing for over 100 years. This graph goes all the way back to 1900, if you can see that. And what struck him was the question, why is this curve so smooth and so steady? We've had wars and recessions and ups and downs in the semiconductor industry. Why is this so uh, predictable? And he looked at this for about 10 or 15 years, um, trying to understand why this was the case, and came up with a very fundamental observation about uh, computing and technology in general, which is once you take any domain or discipline or product area or industry and you ground it in information properties and power it with information, it goes into an exponential growth path. It starts doubling every year or two in its price performance. And once on that path, nothing shakes it off on off that path. It stays on that doubling pattern as far as we can see. This is a fairly profound observation. It's driving everything that we do. And you'll understand why hopefully in uh, uh, as, we, as I continue. Uh, if we go to the next slide, these are the 
uh, disciplines and uh, topics that we study. So the technologies on the top left, AI and robotics, uh, biotech, bioinformatics, medicine, neuroscience, and so on, we study the aspects of those that are doubling in their price performance anywhere from one to two years. Very importantly, the ones on the bottom, design, policy, law, and ethics, future studies, we think about how can you navigate, how can you predict a, uh, an exponential trend which looks linear early in its life cycle? What are the legal and regulatory issues around this? Um, that, uh, that blue 3D printer I showed you, stem cell researchers are using that 3D printer to spray layers of cells one on top of each other, and we're on the verge of fabricating human organs um, using these, stem, these uh, stem cells and so on. And uh, think about the ability to fabricate a human organ uh, using one of these printers will completely change medicine. We're within three to four years of working prototypes of those types of uh, uh, inventions. That will completely change medicine, has enormous ethical issues, regulatory issues. What if someone has it? Uh, Irish, can I have the alcohol process? Ability, um, I live in Ireland for a year, and, and my liver is still suffering. That's the uh, comment. That one, one development will completely change medicine. It has enormous implications. And we have maybe 30 or 40 of these implications that we can see in the next 10 years happening. And how will we absorb that pace of change and that pace of innovation? Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see some of our, uh, our faculty. We've gathered together the leading thinker in the world across a whole set of domains to think about where do all these technologies go, whether it's uh, Craig Venter, who sequenced the first human genome, or the CTO of Intel, or uh, Vince Cerf, who um, uh, created the IP address system. And they're interested because you can be a deep expert in your area, but all of the interesting developments come when you cross different disparate areas together, uh, when you cross nanotech with robotics or AI with medicine. And uh, they are interested in helping us um, with our mission statement. And the next slide has our mission statement as an organization, which is how can you harness the acceleration in these technologies to solve the biggest problems in the world? Um, we have found that we've reused technology repeatedly in our history to uh, address global problems and big challenges. And if we don't use technology, we often end up in, uh, in war, right? I think there are uh, 70 armed conflicts around the world today fighting over clean water because we don't have the right uh, solutions for desalinization, purification, et cetera, at the right price point. And war is a pretty expensive way of progressing humanity. We think technology is a pretty much better way of doing it. Um, and you'll predict by the end of this um, uh, presentation that we tend to be optimists for technology. We think it's a major driver of progress in the world and maybe the only major driver of progress, right? Now, if part of the world is growing exponentially based on computing and the part of the world is linear, that creates a lot of stress. Um, the Arab Spring is an example of that. The, the younger generation is leveraging information in a way that the older generation can barely conceive of, and that's causing a lot of disruption in the world. From, from a business perspective, wherever you have stress, you also have opportunity, right? And that's what we are trying to uh, harness there. And if we have these technologies that are moving so quickly, if you can harness that pace of change in the underlying technologies, then we can scale solutions to a global level very quickly, and that's what we're trying to do. So every summer, we bring together 80 students from 35 or 40 different countries. They come and live with us for 10 weeks at NASA. Our first summer starts literally in uh, 10 days, our next summer. Uh, we're on to our fifth year of this. And for half the summer, we bring in 160 different uh, speakers to deliver 300 or so hours of lectures, labs, and workshops. And we, chat, we look at what's going to happen in these technologies in the future. About 80% of our curriculum is focused on the future as opposed to the past, right? Most academics focus on the past. Well, how did this model evolve? How did this equation evolve? And we complement traditional academics by thinking, where is all this going? What are the implications of that? When we get to, the, say, the $100 genome, what does that mean and what will that imply? What products and services might result? The second half of the summer, we turn into an incubator and we challenge our students to come up with ideas that could impact a billion people within 10 years. Uh, you have three weeks off you go uh, report back. And then we launch those at the end of the summer as research initiatives or for-profit uh, ideas or um, uh, NGOs and so on. Our next, uh, the next slide has uh, one of these examples. This team was looking at the rise of 3D printing and control systems and robotics. And they noticed in construction, the way we build houses today hasn't fundamentally changed in, you know, what, several thousand years. So they designed this giant car wash looking thing. It's a 3D printer that will fabricate a two bedroom house in a day and a half. Uh, using concrete or adobe or sand in the Middle East. Um, is a, that's a photograph on the top left where it's uh, uh, laying ribbons of concrete with a weak pattern of strength. 
And it's at the point where they do a three, uh, a three meter lowering wall, and they end up expanding that to the whole house. This next uh, uh, project, uh, it looked at the poverty. Um, and they noticed in Africa, most of the roads get washed out during the season. Um, this photograph kind of exemplifies it on this next slide, where 85% um, of all the roads in Africa disappear in, during the wet season. And how do you alleviate poverty if you can't move anything around? In the middle of the summer, Chris Anderson from Wired magazine comes and does a talk on drones. And you're, you're familiar with these quadcopter parrot-like things. Um, and he's creating a whole DIY open source movement around this. And, and they, the students looked at this and said, you know, in, in telephony, Africa has leapfrogged the whole wireline generation and gone straight to wireless, right? Everything there is, uh, has gone to that level. Uh, they have very few copper lines laid down. And they'll never really have the money to put roads in. But what if you could use these drones to move medicine and food around? And so they created uh, kind of a next-gen Pony Express uh, called the Matternet that will route uh, medicine and food around using these drones. Um, and then drop packages are off it in pre-installed locations. This is a video in this next slide. This is a video of it doing a live test in Haiti where it's dropping uh, medicine into a camp. And many of these camps are inaccessible by roads. What's interesting about these drones is today a drone can carry a two kilo package about uh, say 10 kilometers, that's the range. But it's doubling in its capability every nine months. So by the end of this year, it'll be able to do four kilos by the middle of next year eight kilos and things get start getting very interesting there. We've already had a phone call from a couple of the major FedEx type companies in the world saying, hey, what are you doing over there? Uh, rather nervous about that type of a solution. And you can imagine that whether this idea works or not for say regulatory reasons or whatever, it'll inspire a whole new way of thinking about transportation. And that's what we're trying to do. And we're teaching our students to spot these doubling patterns, layer solutions on top of those so the solutions can scale at the same level. Um, we also do a one-week executive program that Annalie mentioned that she's been to, and here we're focusing more on the existing leaders in the world. Now, uh, we, we bring them in for a week. We do uh, a half-a-day session across each of the technologies, um, and then we uh, send them back about how could you impact uh, companies, your industries, and where can you find the next billion dollars? If you're running a big company today, and you're not aware of what technologies may come along for probably impact you, you're simply not going to come right? You know, there's a code or Nokia or a BlackBerry where you get white from some aspects of source using technology in a different way. Um, we're also doing some custom programs. Um, um, this is a photograph uh, on this next slide. I'll go one more. Uh, on this next slide, this is a photograph from Uruguay where we did uh, an event with the president of Uruguay and his 150 top policy advisors. Um, uh, last week I was in Hamburg, tomorrow I'm off to Barcelona, so I'm, as Emily mentioned, I'm, we're kind of traveling around talking to policymakers around the world to at least be aware of what these technology breakthroughs are so they can make policy formulated by them. Mostly I'm yelling at people, as you can imagine. Um, this, uh, this next slide is from our curriculum planning meeting, probably the most interesting attribute of our model. Because we're focused on the fastest moving technologies, it means we have to uh, update our curriculum very regularly. So every two months we gather our entire faculty and we revisit every lecture. Um, uh, uh, because say in biotech, we've had four major breakthroughs just in the last year. And so we have had to create almost a near real-time curriculum development methodology to keep pace with the radical changes that are happening. Every two months when we run an executive program, we found the content changes about 20 or 25%. So that gives you a sense for how fast the world is, uh, is changing. So essentially we're trying to create a crucible where we bring the leading thinkers in the world in the fastest moving technologies together, uh, add to that the most accomplished and ambitious young leaders and point them at the biggest problems, right? Something interesting happens as you swirl that around. And we've launched about 50 of these startups in our last five years. Um, so that's a little bit about Singularity University. Let me run through some of the breakthroughs that we're seeing uh, in, across the world. Um, the first section is artificial intelligence. Um, and if we can skip to this next screen, you'll see this, uh, this photograph um, of, uh, I'll wait till the screen changes there. There, you all remember this photograph of Kasparov, right? Um, being beaten by Deep Blue. 20 years ago, we thought there was no way a computer would beat a human being at chess. And then this happened, and now there's no human being that can beat a computer at chess. And artificial intelligence is moving very fast out. In this next slide, we have a little video of a game called Jeopardy, um, where it's an English quiz show which is very difficult. There's a lot of nuance and double meanings and puns and irony. If you look at the picture at the bottom, 
a computer, there's an AI computer that IBM developed that's playing this game that is literally thrashing the two best Jeopardy champions, uh, human players. Literally five years ago, AI experts were saying there's no way a human being could play this game with all of the nuance and irony and humor and puns and irony and so on. And now uh, this has happened. And what happens when you can apply this capability to, say, education or healthcare and so on? Uh, if we can click a couple of times to the next slide, uh, we're going to see where robotics is going. Um, I'll just wait for that. And once more. Okay, so if you look at this, this is uh, robotics. That's a little robot that's jumping up. And that's a, a, a robotic dog at the top. At the bottom, you'll see this uh, little flea robot jumping up onto a roof of a building to do you know, bomb detection and other things. At the top, you'll see this fully autonomous robot running. And it can now do 50 kilometers an hour, this robot. So imagine that thing chasing you down the street uh, with a gun, right? Uh, rather uh, terrifying where that goes. And so robotics has been moving very quickly. This next slide uh, shows, you know, you're all seeing these, these helicopters that are $20 that the kids are playing with. Four years ago, that helicopter cost uh, $700. And eight years ago, the sensors and sobo motors and stabilizer, those weren't even possible. So that's how crazy the world has changed. Eight years ago, not possible. Four years ago, almost $1,000. And now it's $20, right? If we go to the next slide, um, here's a photo, uh, an article from England where this fellow has decided to slip a sensor into his kid's school bag. And he's got a drone following the kid to school so he doesn't have to walk the kid to school. Uh, there are some privacy implications around this. I'm sure the kid is not very happy about it. Um, you can actually buy this uh, online if you feel that you want to uh, play with that. And this one, next one, this next little video is fascinating. These are two drones that are autonomously self-managing themselves and throwing a pole back and forth. Look at the way it's throwing a pole and in real time calculating the trajectory and catching it. Kind of incredible what you can do these days. Uh, with these technologies. Uh, That's a little bit about uh, robotics. Um, the next slide we have um, uh, what's happening in bioinformatics. A few years ago, we found out that the, uh, the, the, the genome uh, was actually drive our is software that drives our, our cells. And we found out that life is actually information. And now we're moving this domain very quickly forward. It cost a billion dollars to sequence for a human genome uh, 20, uh, 12 years ago. The second one cost about 400 million to sequence. The third one cost about 50 million. The fourth one is about 14 million. And you can see that dramatic change over the last few years as we fully digitize the first human genome. It's from a billion dollars to do the first one, the current price is now a less than $1,000. We expect it to go to $100 in two years. And by the end of the decade, it'll be essentially free. It'll be about a penny. It'll be cheaper to sequence your genome than it will be to flush your toilet. Uh, and by the way, when we flush your toilet, we'll sequence, try and sequence everything that goes through there. And so, uh, this is the, one of the use cases of it. If you get a heart attack, they'll try and give you a blood thinner called Plavix. If you have a particular gene, you need a three times dosage of this drug for it to be effective. And a big chunk of the population has that gene. So it's starting to hit very effective um, uh, use cases. Now, when you learn a language like we have the genome, you have reading, comprehension, and then writing. We've learned very well now how to read the genome. Now we're getting to writing the genome. This is a the Woolly Mammoth is a team working on recreating that. We expect that to happen within two to three years. Um, and so that has some implications. This is a photograph from what's called the iGEM competition, International Genetically Engineered Machines. Teams of students are getting together to see how they can hack DNA in different ways. This team's crossed phosphorus, the glow-in-the-dark substance with a cat. And you can now buy a glow-in-the-dark pet. Um, poor cat's not very happy. You can't, it can't hide. Um, they're doing this with plants. One of our teams has launched a Kickstarter project where you can buy plants that glow in the dark. And while it's kind of uh, sounds like a joke and a little Frankensteinian, there are some good implications to this. If you uh, did this with trees and planted trees on the sides of the roads, you would not need street lights, right? Um, and what if, what if you could make uh, a technology, biotech, to, to uh, operate in the same shapes and sizes that we want them to be? Um, we did this kind of as a joke a couple of years ago. This log is photoshopped, but actually now it turns out you can do this. So kind of uh, eerie what we can do. And uh, this is this is very much a joke. But what if Kodak has shifted their business model? They might actually still be in business uh, printing. Um, and again, I don't remember that. All the printing is feasible that you can do today. And a couple of our fact, I love that. They actually created a 3D printer that synthesized DNA after And this photograph, this next photograph, this is a biotech class being taught 
um, if we can flip to the next uh, slide. Um, and that's an eight-year-old girl, and she's the teacher. She's leading the class in how to synthesize DNA. It turns out she's really good at it and doesn't have the preconceptions of what this will all mean. Um, the next slide is kind of this inflection point. Three years ago, Craig Venter, who sequenced the first genome, did this. He, he synthesized the first fully artificial life form. He took a million base pair bacteria DNA, put it into his computer, hacked it to his own modifications, changed it to his own specs, replaced the DNA of an existing bacteria. And today we have, for the first time in the history of the world, a self-replicating life form, and its parent DNA is an email file. Okay? That's an inflection point. The world will never be the same again. We're now going to see whole slews of different artificial life forms that have never existed in the world before. And that has extraordinary implications for how this works. And you can do this now in your bedroom. That's the kind of freaky part about this. Now, this has crazy implications. You know, I grew up hacking PCs. Uh, the kids today are programming the internet. I have an 18 month old son and he will be hacking the family dog. And how will we deal with that as a society is, is kind of an open question. If we go to the next slide, um, we'll move on to neuroscience. Uh, we, our brain has not had an upgrade in about, what, 50,000 years, and it's operating on all these old biases. Uh, and if we can do a few clicks on the next slide, um, uh, if we do like six or eight clicks, we'll kind of just, you can see some of the issues that we have in our brain, scientific illiteracy, math illiteracy, computer uh, cor corruption, and so on. For example, my brain and my nervous system is programmed to grab every calorie can and hoard it. Uh, because it uh, doesn't know where it's going to get its next calorie, right? But if you look at me, I'm really not short of calories and uh, maybe too many. And could I reprogram in my brain and so on? If we can click through to the next slide, you'll see I've got a list of just some of the human biases and heuristics that we have and how our brain navigates, whether it's confirmation bias or uh, base rate bias and so on. And this is why we need artificial intelligence. Uh, we actually think of AI as augmented intelligence. Um, because we use it to support and complement our mitigate, mitigate our weaknesses in our own brain. Um, uh, neuroscience has moved very fast over the last few years, information enabled now that it is. And if you look at this next slide, um, you'll see on the one side our old view of the brain, um, which is a gray lump of matter. We didn't know what was going on. Today, you can actually watch a single neuron firing in your head in real time if you lie down in an MRI machine. And so this is pretty fascinating what will happen is we can figure out how to interface with this organ. For example, we still don't know why memory works, how memory works. We still don't know why we sleep, which is kind of amazing. And what happens when we can interface this old organ that runs our cells with all of these different technologies, some incredible things will come available to us. Um, you can now today buy these $100 headsets that do some amazing things uh, and you can graph your own brain. And this next slide shows a technology that, uh, that kind of I, even I can find a little freaky. And it kind of takes a lot to freak me out, and you can imagine uh, what that's like. Um, this is called optogenetics. They've genetically engineered a new type of neuron that happens to be very light sensitive. If you, if you shine a light on it, the neuron will force fire. Rather than relying on 10,000 other neurons to give it a signal to fire or not, it will just fire up when light shines on it. They've then used a virus to distribute the neuron in the localized part of the brain of a mouse uh, in this case, where compassion sits. This was actually funded by the Dalai Lama. So now you have these light sensitive uh, neurons in the part of the brain compassion sits for of a brain of a mouse. They plugged an optical fiber into the head of the mouse, turned on the switch, light floods the cranial cavity, uh, the neurons fire, and the mouse becomes uber compassionate. Um, uh, pretty wild. Uh, you can similarly make the mouse turn left or right if you put it in the motor motor cortex. And this is pretty Frankensteinian at one level. Uh, on the other level, we have enormous possibilities for treating Alzheimer's, dementia, ALS, and so on, Parkinson's, um, if we can interrupt and force fire specific neural circuits in the brain, and they're investigating that. This technology is literally three years old. So this is moving very, very fast. Um, uh, so I've got to talk about these technologies. I wanted to talk about uh, uh, why an information-based environment becomes exponential. Right? So you can flip to the next slide. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember uh, film photography, right? If you're in the room. Uh, and when you had film photography, we're operating from a linear basis. We're operating on a linear environment where every incremental photograph you take, a chunk of money for the film, the processing, about a dollar a photograph, right? Um, if we go from that to digital photography, um, the marginal cost of an extra photograph goes essentially to zero. Um, and now you can have billions of new photographs. You keep just the ones you want. 
that you're not operating from a scarcity model, you're operating from an abundance model, and it completely changes the game uh, in that. And while very few people have the expertise to actually make a camera and have the, the experts in-house, uh, when you open it up, uh, up a, a camera and a cell phone, a billion uh, developers can now hack away at what does a camera look like in a mobile phone, and we have very fast-moving areas there. So this is the best example I found of why a digital environment makes such a big change. Once you have an information-based environment, there's no friction to move and copy it around, zero marginal cost. You can apply correlations and computation and simulation, machine learning, and so on, and the whole environment moves very, very quickly. And we're seeing this happen across the board, okay, across all of these technologies. Now, from a societal perspective, this has huge concern for us because they're all very sexy. We're seeing front page uh, stories on all these technologies, but fundamentally, we are not set up to, uh, to do this pace of change. If I could have some volume on this, I want you to listen to this video. Shit. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh my God. <laughs> this is the Google one. What? It's driving itself. <laughs> ah! Ah! All right, you, you, you get the general idea. That's the Google autonomous car. Uh, driving at a speed higher than you, faster than you could around an obstacle course. And that scream that you heard, right, and I apologize for the swearing, but I, I know in Australia you don't really swear very much, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. But that scream that you heard, that's the visceral scream of humanity meeting advanced technology. Um, and when you first get into a car and it goes or takes off like that, that's the visceral reaction. It's very primal. After 10 minutes, it's like getting into an elevator or a lift. You press a button and it takes you where you want to go. But that's the first reaction. And that's always the societal reaction to the technology developments that come along. And you'll, you'll have had that reaction when you saw some of what I've shown you already. Right? Now, just the Google car I wanted to touch on that. Uh, people look back in 10 or 15 years and wonder why did we ever let human beings drive? We have terrible control systems for getting cars going at high speed. Right? Um, we have a million people here that we kill with traffic accidents. We now fly most of our planes without uh, an intervention if, for the most part. And why not do that with cars? Right? And so this is the radical pace of change that we'll see. We expect, by the way, the capacity of roads and highways to increase more than 10 times when these autonomous cars are fully rolled out. And the Google autonomous car has already done half a million kilometers on California streets and highways without an accident. Okay? So that's the dramatic change, but I want you to remember that scream, because that's the scream of our visceral biological selves being based in a linear and local world. Uh, you know, anything important that happened 100 years ago happened within a day's walk, and now something that happens in Tokyo affects us in minutes, right? And so we're not used to this. If we can flip the next slide, you'll see a crossed out of the Fourth Amendment, that's the right to privacy uh, in the U.S. Constitution, I mentioned I'm Canadian, so it doesn't affect me anyway. I don't have any expectation of privacy. But if you're an American, this is a huge pillar of American society disappearing with pretty much no public discourse about it, right? The next slide shows the patent system, fundamentally broken. Large tech companies today are spending more on litigation than they are on R&D, and that's a really bad place to be. Um, from a regulatory perspective, this next slide shows, I, I showed you our curriculum planning meetings. Um, this photograph of our curriculum planning meetings. Um, uh, even though we have the best lecturers, speakers, teachers, thought leaders in the world coming to speak at SU, we can't become an official accredited state sanctioned university because to do that, you have to fix your curriculum and not change it, right? And so this is the gap that we're asking. How does any regulatory framework keep pace as technology is accelerating away from us? If we can skip forward a couple of slides, we'll see the um, uh, We'll see what's happening with big companies. Um, uh, it used to take 20 years to create a billion dollar opportunity, and now we're seeing that happen in months, right? The next slide shows the uh, newspaper industry. And once we, we found that once we fully information enable an industry, it goes into a deflationary mode. We have a drop in revenues because information is so easy to move around, no intermediaries. This is the newspaper business, 10x drop in revenues uh, as we see that. Um, the next slide shows the news, the music business, same 10x drop in revenues, right? The next slide shows Netflix versus Blockbuster, streaming video versus renting video, DVDs. Uh, Blockbuster has gone out of business, gone bankrupt. And we are very bad at this. Now, I wanted to touch on this for a minute. This is Vinod Kosla speaking at our closing ceremonies a couple of years ago. He founded Sun Microsystems, a pretty famous venture capitalist. 
the note we've seen over the last 10 years exponential growth in mobile phones um, in the last 10 years doubling every two years to now what five and a half billion mobile phones around the world Vinod did an analysis, and you look back at 2002, 2004, 6, 8, and so on, and asked the question, what did the mobile industry expert analysts say would be the growth of mobile phones at each of those points in time, right? How did we predict, well, did we predict it? In 2002, he went and looked at Gartner, Forrester, McKinsey's, Jupiter, and so on, and found that collectively, they said, this is a growing industry. We expect 16% year-on-year growth in this industry. Two years later, gone up 100%, so they were off by a bit. In 2004, they projected 14% year-on-year growth. Then it went up another 100%. And in 2006, they said 12%. Okay? Then it went up another 100%. And in 2008, unable to process the fact that we've had three doublings in a row of 100% each, they said 10%. Okay? And then it went up another 100%. Right? Now, how much more wrong can you be from 10% to 100%? You can't be too much more wrong than that. And you're the mobile phone industry expert, right? The people rely on for strict planning, and governments rely on for big policy making, and so on. And you're off by that much. And he was able to show that this wasn't just in mobile phones, that this happened in energy, in bandwidth, uh, uh, network storage, all sorts of different domains. The experts in the domain always project out linearly. But the problem is the world is now moving anywhere where it's information enabled moving on this exponential growth path. Um, our favorite example is if you take 30 steps linearly, one, two, three, four, you'll get to the back of the room and you can project in your heads very well where you'll be at one third of the way, where you'll be two thirds of the way in that linear progression from zero to 30. If you take 30 exponential steps and double it every step, two, four, eight, 16, at step 30, you're in uh, 26 times around the world, you've gone a billion meters, right? And it's very hard to gauge where are you one third of the way, where are you two thirds of the way, in that projection. And that's the visceral cognitive shift that we're trying to gauge and kind of come across. Um, if we skip to the next slide, we've, we've seen these impacts happening at industry level. And new business models are now being built on this, right? Google was a joke 10 years ago. It's now almost a $300 billion company by essentially manipulating text and video. Uh, Facebook, $70 billion company, just by digitizing your relationships. If you think about yourselves, most of us don't have our memories in our heads anymore. We've outsourced that to our smartphones, right? Um, and, and our relationships, our communications, everything's pretty much analog. We're augmenting ourselves using technology in this new digital world. And new business models will come along as we put all these different sensors out into the world. Uh, the next slide shows the, the 3D printing again. I'm going to show, if you can see my camera, this is a 3D printed little assembled uh, gadget with a universal gear in it, right? Now, um, uh, you, if you had to make that, you would have to kind of assemble different plastic parts together. But this thing essentially comes out of the 3D printer in one, uh, one step. This is our class ring, which is the 3D printer. If I want to do it in size, uh, I just tell it I want to size it eight and it prints it. Um, and so we're seeing, as we see, industry level implications. Now we're going to start seeing macro level implications of these technologies. Um, uh, China, uh, the, the, the economy of China is fundamentally based on cheap, assembling cheap plastic parts, right? Um, now we're going to see. Uh, China, as in a few years, we'll all have 3D printers at home. The cheapest ones are now $500, and they're dropping in price 50% a year. And in China, they'll have their entire the foundation of their economy disrupted within the next five to 10 years uh, as people manufacture things at home. If I need a belt, I just print it at home. If I need a toy for my child, I just fabricate it at home or at a local center. The shipping uh, issues will happen, and so on. And uh, now, for the U.S., not a good outcome. Uh, they'll start calling in their debt. For Germany, what happens to their trade with China? I was speaking uh, to the mayor of Hamburg last week, and I mentioned to him that we were going to have huge issues in, at these levels. Um, so let's skip to the next slide. Um, uh, basically, where does all this mean? Where is all this going? And I think there's a couple of major drivers. Um, essentially, all innovation is now happening at a small individual level. I don't see large in companies or governments innovating at all. If you, even I, I would argue that Google fundamentally is not that innovative, but if it was, then Foursquare, Zynga, Twitter, Facebook should not exist, and yet they do. Their Google X program is, the, is an example of really fantastic innovation where they've taken it outside the mothership so they can innovate freely. Disruptive innovation will not happen inside large companies going forward. It'll happen externally. Let me give you a couple of examples of that to round this out. If you go to the next slide, this is a, a little diagram. This is, you can go buy a $100 headset, which will tell you what kind of brainwave frequencies you have in your head. $100, you put it on, you can see it. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the image of a photograph. 
And on the left, that's me wearing a headset. Uh, and that's my brain with one of these headsets. On the right, taking the photograph is a fellow called Will Henschel. He was the guitar. He was a guitarist for the uh, Eurythmics, the band from the 1980s, and a lead guitarist for the London Beat, another band. And uh, what Will is doing, he's composing music that when you play the music will put your brain into a focused alpha state and put your brain into a focused state if you need to turn out emails or work on PowerPoint or work on spreadsheets. That's the brain state you want to be on. So if you flip to the next slide, you'll see my brain before and after he plays the music. And in the next slide, you'll see my brain is flooded with alpha waves because he's playing music. And this is live. It's on a website called Focus at Will. And you can go play and use it for free for developers, uh, students, uh, uh, knowledge workers, and so on. Now, just imagine this is a multi gajillion idea, right? It'll, it'll impact the pop industry, the Red Bull industry, the amphetamine black market to some extent, hopefully. Um, and he's doing this with a Mac and a $100 headset. Just amazing. If we go to the next slide, you'll see Dean Kamen. Um, Dean invented the Segway uh, and the robotic car. Sure, I've got five more slides to go. The next slide will show a machine that he has built called a slingshot. And what he does here is he takes anything wet coming to one side of this machine, uh, sludge, sewage, seawater, arsenic laden water. At the other side, because 100% purified injectable distilled water. And that machine uses 10 light bulbs of power. The next slide will show that he's just struck a deal with Coke and they're now distributing the machine. They've been live testing it in seven villages in Ghana for the last six months. And they'll now start offering water for at about a penny a liter anywhere in the world for at to any village. And essentially this could take out the clean water problem literally by himself. Uh, um, uh, when you take out clean water as a problem, you take out also half the world's infectious diseases, okay? And my last example, this next slide, is a company of ours called Modern Meadow. And what they're doing is they've noticed that as the middle class grows, we're going to be eating a lot more meat. We're going to need 50 billion new farm animals for meat processing in the next two to three decades. And so they're growing meat in a lab, in a petri dish, uh, because it's fairly inexpensive and inefficient to hack it out of the side of a cow. Much better if you can grow it in a lab. Um, and so they're off to the races with this. Of course, if they succeed and it looks like they will, then the economies of Uruguay, Argentina are pretty impacted because they do a lot of selling of beef. Um, now, it tastes terrible right now. Uh, uh, but it's doubling in its taste every year or so, so be careful with this. So we expect this to have some pretty magical outcomes. So to wrap up, uh, the next slide, I kind, of, I kind of go back to the beginning, um, where I've tried to show that uh, these information-enabled environments with all these technologies are leading to lots of breakthroughs. If we can skip to the uh, next to last slide, that would be great. Where were you? Um, if we can click through to the, to the final slide, uh, which is showing the disruption. Um, and the next slide, right, right there, perfect. So we have two options as a society, right? Um, if you think about all of the changes in the world over the last 20 years, mostly due to internet and now just mobile, that's a lot of the changes in the last 20 years. Just in the next 10 years, we have 3D printing, uh, synthetic biology, neuroscience, AI, robotics, all kinds of lines. We are not set up to this change. This is a great deal of concern. And all of the mechanisms we use to run the world today are civics, politics, healthcare systems, education systems, and so on. We're all set up for a world 100 or 200 years ago, not for the world today. But if we can shift our mindset, we can actually go to a world of abundance down at the bottom, where we can navigate all of these technologies properly. And we have today an information in abundance. Uh, we could soon have energy abundance, healthcare abundance, education abundance, and that's what we're trying to go for. So uh, let me wrap it up there. I think we're going to have a little difficulty with Q&A, uh, but I wanted to thank you for your time. And Annalie, thanks for having me.